You look like you want to kill me, dude. Well, he wants to vomit. I don't want to vomit. <laughs> but I'm also going to show you two ways that you can know that someone's going to cheat at a card game before they even do. That way you can't be cheated out of your money. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. This week we are talking about Robbie J. DeLuke. And last week during a high stakes table match, she made a very unorthodox move. And as a result, she won a pretty massive pot. Her opponent, Garrett Adelstein, was visibly shocked by her decision. He couldn't figure out why she played the hand the way she did. He got up, he left the table and maintains until this moment that she must have cheated. She denies all accusations and says that she simply read his tells. All over social media, people have all kinds of theories, a whole bunch of people accusing her with different various methods that she was cheating, a whole bunch of people defending her saying, this is what happened, she thought this, she played it this way, and the internet is split. But in this video, we're gonna look at all those theories and narrow it down and I'm gonna tell you what is most likely happening in this situation. Now, since there are a lot of people chiming in on this with some nonsense theories that I will be disproving in this video, I wanna really quickly start by explaining why I'm uniquely qualified to analyze this situation. For any viewers who stumbled upon this video or you're not familiar with my channel, I wanna explain why I feel qualified to do this. The first reason, the obvious one, the reason this channel exists is that I am a body language and behavioral analyst. I have a degree in sociology with a minor in psychology. I have a certification in criminal interrogation as well as body language analysis. And I teach people all over the world how to read body language. So in the video, I will be applying that. We will look at her body language to see if it suggests cheating or honesty. We'll look at his body language to see if he's leaking any tells that she may have picked up on. The second reason I think I'm very uniquely qualified to comment on this is because for over 15 years I've been a touring performing mentalist. Now a lot of people misunderstand what a mentalist is because movies and TV shows misrepresent what we do. A mentalist is basically a magician but instead of doing visual tricks like making a coin disappear we tell you the name of the person you're thinking of or we unlock your phone or we predict the choices that you're going to make we do things that are a little bit more of a psychological nature. Now, as much as a lot of mentalists out there, myself included, study nonverbal communication, body language, persuasion, to make their performances better and more convincing, the basis of mentalism remains trickery. Now, you might be wondering how that plays into this situation, but if you think about it, mentalists and magicians are the world heavyweight champions of having secret ways to know what you're looking at. So if you take two cards out of a deck, and I need to know what those cards are. As a mentalist, I've studied every conceivable way to know that, and there are thousands. And we use these techniques not to cheat, but to entertain. But nonetheless, a lot of the ways she's being accused of cheating, I'm very familiar with, and I could tell you whether it's likely or not. The third and final reason, and this is right up my alley, is more of a subsection of the second reason, but it's how familiar I am with a deck of cards. Like I said, before I was a mentalist, I was obsessed with card magic and sleight of hand, and that obsession never really went away. I've had the absolute privilege of learning card cheating techniques from some of the best card mechanics in the world. Not car mechanics, card mechanics. A card mechanic is someone who studies sleight of hand, but more particularly the type of sleight of hand that would allow you to cheat in a poker game. Now it's very important to note that neither me nor any of my friends or teachers who study this do it to cheat people out of their money. We learn it strictly for entertainment and cheating prevention. And as such, in this video, I'm gonna show you two ways that you can know that someone's going to cheat before they even do it. And I really hope that you will use this to prevent being cheated as opposed to using this to cheat other people because that's just really not a great practice. All right, so with that in mind, this video is gonna be a little different than my other analysis videos. The way I'm gonna do it is we're gonna tackle one at a time the big theories that are out there. And I'm gonna tell you whether they're likely or unlikely using body language, uh, card cheating techniques, and mentalism or magic techniques that one can use to know what someone's looking at or to gain secret information. Okay, to start off, let's tackle one of the card cheating techniques that's being thrown around, and I will show you how to prevent someone using this to cheat you. So this is a term that a lot of people throw around because they've heard it, but I don't think most people realize what it means. And the term is marked cards. Now, first and foremost, there's a difference between marked cards 
and marking cards. And I don't think most people understand the distinction. We're going to tackle each of them as a different thing, starting with marked cards. So what does it mean for a card or a deck of cards to be marked? Well, basically it means that on the back design, on the artwork on the back of the card, somewhere there's a small hidden indication that if you know where to look and what you're looking for allows you to know what the card is. In most cases, it indicates the value and the suit of the card, but in some cases, you only get one or the other. So how is this mark placed there? Well, there's two options. The first is in the printing process. So whoever's designing and selling this deck of cards has purposely made the back design marked and they've made small distinctions on the back that would allow you to know what it is if you know what you're looking for. The second way is marking the deck afterwards. So you can use a knife to scratch certain areas, you can use a marker to add certain things, but subtly you're adding something to each card in a system that allows you to know what each one is. So two big questions. First, was a marked deck possibly used in this game? And two, how do you prevent yourself from being cheated by someone using a marked deck? So is it possible that they were using a marked deck? And the answer is most probably. And I mean most probably like 99.9% .9 no. Because first of all, that would entail that someone at the organization is in on this cheat and has specifically marked a deck of regulation cards for this game and brought them into play. That is really a complicated process and a really big scheme. But that's not even the main reason that I don't think they're using a marked deck. The main reason is the following. In most cases, marked decks have very small subtle markings, especially because the deck they're using in this game has a very simple back design. There isn't a lot of intricate stuff going on. So you would have to hide it even more subtly because it can't really blend in. She is simply not close enough to see the markings on most decks of cards because with most of them, even at an arm's length, you're not going to see it. There are some exceptions, but those would be way too obvious in a game like this. The other players would see that, wait a second, there's something weird with the back of that card. So she is not using a marked deck, but how can you make sure that someone you're playing cards with isn't using a marked deck? Now, I've done this test a lot. I've asked people, I've given them a deck of cards and said, try to see if this is a marked deck. And most people, a majority of people, will take two or three cards and do this. And look at them and stare at them and study them. This is useless because if you don't know what you're looking for, you can look at the back of the card all you want. By the time you shift your gaze and look at the other one, you're not going to notice that subtle difference. You could take, for most marked decks, they're really clever. It could take you forever looking at them. You don't know what you're looking for. But there's a really simple way where not in minutes, but in seconds, you can know if a deck of cards is marked. The method is called the flip book technique. And here's how it's done. And the beauty of this, by the way, is you don't even have to tell the person that you suspect them of cheating because no one's going to know what's going on. It takes a second. Here's how it works. You take the deck of cards and you hold it from the sides like this. So it's facing outwards and your fingers are rigidly on the sides like this. Your index finger is curled in the back like this. Your right hand comes over or your other hand, whatever hand you're holding it in. At the top like this, you're going to bend the cards as much as you can and you're going to flip through the cards like this. Exactly like a flip book. And while you're doing that, you're going to look at the back of the deck like this. And here's what's going to happen. If there is a small marking on each card that indicates what it is, it would be in different spots on each card, obviously. So as you do that, your eyes are going to spot something jumping around, moving around. For example, with this deck, as I do it, you'll notice nothing's moving around, nothing's shifting. Everything looks uniform. Now, I do have a couple dozen marked cards back there, but the methods in which they're marked isn't my secret to share, so I can't show you how it would be different, but in every single one of those cases, if you grab it and you do the flip book like this, you're gonna see something moving. Our eyes are much better at catching movement and change rather than something subtle and stagnant. So the flip book technique takes you seconds and you will know if a deck of cards is marked. Second, what is marking a deck and how is it different than a marked deck? So marking a deck means that afterwards you're going to add something to the back of the deck. So earlier I said you might add markings with a, with a, with a knife or with a marker. That is called marking a deck, but more specifically adding a substance to the back of the deck, which is called a daub or juice. In July of 2013, famous gambler Archie Carras 
was arrested at a casino in California after making thousands of dollars at a blackjack table because he was secretly marking the backs of the blackjack cards with something called a daub. So basically, he has a substance in his pocket, he rubs it on one of his fingers, and when the cards are dealt, in some casinos you're allowed to touch those cards, he would take all the high cards, 10 jacks, queens, kings, and aces, and he would subtly mark them with this substance. Now, a daub is a substance that, if you know what you're looking for, you can see it. It shines a little different, but it remains excessively subtle. Juice is a little bit different than that because juice is rarely applied in real time. That's the main difference. You juice a deck. In other words, you prepare the deck. What you do is you might create a system where you say, okay, well, if it's a diamond, I'm going to go here. If it's a heart, I'm going to go here. And each card you juice. You put the substance on it. So now you have a deck of cards that could be mixed and it works like a marked deck. When the card is set down, you know how to spot that substance. It reflects slightly differently and you know what the card is, but it's really hard to spot that. But another way that juice is used, and this is a really high tech way, is that you take the cards and you flat out with this substance, write the name of the card on the back of it. So a big eight and a big diamond in the case of the eight of diamonds. And you need a special pair of contact lenses in order to see what that is. So if you're wearing the contact lenses, you could see on the back of this card clear as day, a giant eight and a giant diamond. But if you're not wearing those contact lenses or those glasses, you're not going to see anything. It's, it's almost an invisible ink system. So did she use daub or juice? Well, with juice, again, it's a no for me because the deck would have had to be prepared and then brought into play. And I just don't think that that's what's happening here. But the daub is interesting. Is there a possibility that she had some sort of substance on her and when the cards went by, when there was high cards, she marked them somehow in a way that only she knows how to see. That way, she would know on the table who has high cards and who doesn't. I actually want to circle back to that theory because once we get more into the game, we look at the body language, we see what's going on, we understand a little bit more what the cards were, I want to circle back and talk about the possibility of a dog. But I will give you a hint. I'm not accusing her of anything at all, but if you told me that for a fact she cheated, and asked me how she did it, my first guess would be a daub, not the other popular theories that are circulating. Let's keep going and look at why. Okay, now we're gonna tackle the most popular theory that's circulating online as to what happened, and I'm gonna tell you why I think it's highly improbable. I'm gonna show you a really practical way to know if someone's gonna cheat at cards before they even do it, and we're gonna look at the body language to see if she cheated or if she did not. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more body language and behavioral analysis. Although we really haven't done any of that in this video so far, but I swear it's coming, just in a couple of minutes, coming right up. Okay, next let's address the most popular theory. This is all over the internet, it's in videos and discussions and comments, and so many people are convinced that they saw something, and I'm gonna tell you exactly what they saw, uh, and this is the vibration device theory. So the theory that she has a vibration device. And we have to split this into two because there are two places that people think that this vibration device is. And the first one is a vibration device in her jacket or in her pocket on her leg. And first of all, let's get something very straight. It's not called a vibration device. It's certainly not an adult toy. It's called a thumper. And look at that. You could find it on Amazon for $43. Mental is a magic trick, pro thumper. And what is a thumper? Basically, it's a device where one person presses a button on a remote and the other person feels a vibration on the receiver. So you can use this to cheat at many games or you can use it to convince your friends that you are a mentalism master psychic by closing your eyes and having them write down a number from one to 10 and your friend in the room can hit the button that many times and then you feel a vibration go vroom, 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 and you're like, it's three and they freak out and then you become a professional mentalist. Now I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. I've studied mentalism almost my entire adult life and I've studied thumpers, I've read about thumpers, I've seen thumpers, endless kinds of thumpers, but I don't know a single professional mentalist working today that uses a confederate and a thumper to know what someone's thinking simply because we have much better, much more convincing, and much more advanced methods. But regardless of that, thumpers are a thing. And the first theory is that she's using one in her clothes. And the most compelling argument for this is at some point, it cuts to a side angle, and you can see her chair and her coat vibrating. And the reason people are saying that this is a thumper or a vibration device 
is because, well, she's just pensive, she's just paused, and they think that she's waiting for those vibrations, and then it, when it stops, she knows what she needs to do because her confederates let her know, listen to me, look, look at Spidey, listen. That is not happening. Let me tell you why. Two reasons why. One is because I know what a thumper is, and two, body language. So the reason that's not happening is because if she had a thumper on her and it was vibrating, you would not see it. These aren't blenders, they're not jackhammers. They're very subtle vibrations. You put one in your, in your pocket, you put one on a piece of clothing, it doesn't vibrate like that. It doesn't cause a level two earthquake on the Richter scale to where we would see it like that when she's sitting on the side angle, never. Again, I've seen these things, I've held them, the vibration is so subtle, but because it's on you, it's touching you, you can really feel it. It's also not that fast. That vibration is like, stops and she says something. It's useless, what is that gonna tell her? A thumper is usually more like, vroom, vroom, vroom. so it just really doesn't work that way. I'll tell you exactly what we're seeing from that side angle, and this goes back to the body language stuff. When we're thinking, especially in a high stress situation, we fidget. So you might have a pen in your hands and you go like this, or you might even go like this, or drum your fingers on the table. It's very likely that she's tapping her foot. We could tell by her behaviors, she has quite a bit of anxiety. She, we see her, you know, this is, let's be honest, this is probably someone who's feeling a lot more comfortable with her phone on her, check social media, text, be on a phone call. She doesn't have her phone, not allowed to have it in there. She's always looking for something, she's moving a lot, she moves a lot more than most poker players. So it's very possible that here, she's simply tapping her foot because she's just thinking. And obviously, when she's done thinking and she came to a thought, she stops the tapping, therefore the vibration stops. Now for those of you who normally watch my channel, you know that I'm almost never 100% on something, like I usually consider all options. There's no doubt in my mind. If there was a thumper on her, it wouldn't look that way, ever. Which brings us to the second theory, which is that her ring that she's wearing is a thumper. And the best argument for this is that at some point, she's fiddling with it like this, and she kind of turns to the side, drops her hand, and when she comes back up, it's been rotated. So clearly under the table, she was messing around with it. So is her ring a thumper? Good question. No, and for two very good reasons. The first reason is, if you had a thumper, why the heck would it be in plain sight? Why would you put it somewhere where people could look at it and go, hey, that must be a vibration device? You would put it in your pocket. Because when you put it in your pocket, especially with tight pants the way she's wearing, you would feel it a lot more effectively than on your finger. But when the thumper is up against your leg, you can really feel those vibrations. Trust me, I've tried. The second thing is thumpers are not powered by witchcraft and wizardry. They're powered by electricity. Most of them, like the one we see on Amazon, have a battery or at the very least have to be charged. I have personally never seen a thumper that small. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm sure with today's technology, you can charge it, but she's in that room for a very long time. She needs something that could hold a charge for a good long while, I suspect there would be a little bit more. Yes, there's a big jewel on top of it, but it's a very dainty ring. I suspect you would need more volume to it, to power it, to charge it for a battery, something. It, listen, once again, I've seen a lot of thumpers. None of them were that small. In fact, none of them were even close to that small, at least twice as big. Okay, time for me to show off a little bit with a deck of cards and show you how to spot cheating at cards before it even happens and to answer one of the accusations that is online. It's not one of the biggest ones, but it's there enough for me to just put it to rest right now. The accusation is that the dealer at that table, not the whole organization, but the dealer specifically is in on it, is working with her, and is cheating with the cards to set up hands like this where she could win a lot of money. So to tackle that first, let's take a look at what card cheating would look like. Angle change. Hello, welcome to the new angle. So I've got a deck of cards, and uh, this can be borrowed, by the way. It doesn't, it's not a special deck of cards, nothing wrong with it, you can hand me any deck of cards. But let's talk about the reason I know that the dealer at that game can't possibly be cheating, and that is false deals. False deals are pretty much the center of card cheating and are really hard to get it right, but once you get it right, it could be very, very dangerous. So to demonstrate, I've placed the four aces at the bottom of the deck. So those are the four aces, they're the only aces in the deck. It's not like I have a whole bunch more uh, to try to sell this as something that it's not. Now watch carefully, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna deal just, just two packets. So I'll go back and forth, all from the top, watch carefully. So we go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. 
So I've dealt two packets of four from the top. Now these cards are all random, all came from the top. We have a four, a six, a five, and a two, doesn't matter. But these cards are actually the four aces. Clubs, spades, hearts, and diamonds. Because although it seemed like they were coming from the top, they were not. Let me slow it down. So what's going on basically in a convincing way, as it seems like I'm dealing that top card, in fact, I'm dealing the bottom card. So that's the ace coming out from the bottom. And this is a top card, this, and there's a retention of vision because that top card is moving. I pull it out and I pull it back as that card comes out from the bottom. So here's what it looks like when I do it rapidly. It looks like the cards are coming from the top, but all of these cards are actually coming from the bottom of the deck. For you to better see what's going on, I will put a random card face up on top. So you could see right there the two of diamonds and you will see how that stays at the top. Watch the two of diamonds, it remains there as the cards come not from the top, but from the bottom. Now bottom deals are not the only false deals. There are also second deals, which is basically when you get the second card instead of the top one. And there are even some card mechanics who can center deal. It's extremely difficult, but basically instead of going and grabbing the bottom card, that middle finger goes into the center of the deck and pulls out a card from the middle. And it's really, really difficult to do in a convincing way. And it just looks astonishing when it's well done. But this all comes down to the fact that it's possible to know if someone is going to false deal from a deck of cards before they even do it to the point where I can guarantee you that the dealer at that table did not cheat. In fact, I can guarantee you that she doesn't know how to cheat. She's a great dealer, but she doesn't know how to cheat. And I'll tell you why. It's all in the grip, the way the deck is held. Mechanics or card cheaters hold a deck very differently than a dealer. If we look at the footage of the dealer at this table, she's holding the deck like this. She's got well, her top finger is shorter than mine, so it doesn't quite make it out here. It's closer to the center over here. And she's got her three other fingers over here on the side. Now, as much as this is a really great grip for dealing cards, because you can individually pull cards off, and you could see she is like lightning fast with that, as you would expect from someone who does it professionally, it's not practical for cheating. Card mechanics use something called a mechanics grip. And the mechanics grip looks like this. This is something we have to practice to hold the deck in this way. The old school way of doing the mechanics grip is this, and some still do it this way, where the index comes across like this to the corner. But a more and more popular way of doing the mechanics grip, and it's the way I use, is this, where the middle finger is extending across to this corner over here. And the reason this is great, well, a few. First, the index is now blocking the front of the deck. You cannot see where the cards are coming from. Second, it looks like all my fingers are holding the deck, but they're not. Only my middle finger is. It's holding the whole deck. My other fingers are free to help me maneuver. And finally, this side opening, which is vitally important because that can allow me to go there and grab that card. The fingers aren't blocking. So with this grip, when you see one of the fingers, either the middle finger or the index finger in that corner and there's pressure, you could see that pressure. You could see my finger bubbling out because it's holding the deck by itself. And if someone holds a deck of cards this way, they know how to cheat and are probably about to cheat because there's no other reason to hold a deck this way. It hurts, it's unpleasant. You can see right there, the, the pad of the thumb, because I'm really digging into it with the, with the corner like this. I'm putting a lot of pressure to hold it in place like this. So it's not pleasant. It's, you know, if you're just gonna deal cards, there's no reason to hold it this way, but if you're gonna cheat, then this is the way to hold a deck of cards. So if you see someone holding a deck of cards like this, or like this, right to the corner with some pressure, it's likely they're about to cheat. Keep an eye on them. Let's look at some theories that defend her, who say she's not cheating because. So one popular theory that's circulating a lot is, well, she's obviously not cheating because earlier throughout her day, she made some plays that were not great. She made some bad calls. So if she was cheating, she wouldn't have done that. This is a really quick counter to that. No, because cheaters don't always cheat. Cheaters wait for the opportune moment to cheat. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that because I don't think this was too much of an opportune moment at all, but cheaters wait for the right moment to cheat. They're not constantly cheating. It's too suspicious. Also, depending on the method that she's using, like if she's using a daub or something, maybe she doesn't always have the opportunity to cheat because maybe it doesn't apply in this case. Maybe she doesn't see what she's supposed to see. So it's a very, incorrect conclusion to say if she was cheating she wouldn't have made other mistakes because cheaters don't always cheat the next theory that's been 
heavily debated online and people are going back and forth, back and forth, yes she did, no she didn't, is that she misunderstood the cards that she had. In, in essence, she forgot which cards she was holding and she thought she was holding a different hand. Now, to understand why this was such a bad call and almost any poker player on the planet is looking at this and saying there is no way she would have gone all in with what she had, you have to understand the rules of poker a little bit. There are a ton of great channels that explain statistically what is happening in this hand. I'm not gonna get into that too much because a lot of people are talking about that. I'm talking about the behaviors and the cheating techniques. So for this argument, let's just say this. If she had a jack three or if she thought she had a jack three, this decision wouldn't be as disastrous. So Matt Glantz on Twitter shared a post saying that she thought she had a jack three and didn't want to come out and admit that because it's embarrassing to admit that on national television. She retweeted that and said nailed it. She also said numerous times that she thought she had a jack three. Now, did she think she had a jack three? Well, there's some contradicting information. First of all, really important to note that in the previous hand, the hand before this one, she did in fact have exactly a jack three. Not the same suits, but she had a jack three. And this happens in poker where we, as we try to remember what cards we have, we remember the hand we had before. Now, when the pot is this big, you make sure you know what you have in your hands. In fact, she did that. She looked down at her cards numerous times, a lot during this play. So it's unlikely that she didn't know that she had a jack four, but it's possible that she went back and forth with it and there are times where she forgot and times where she remembered. I've seen that happen too. To further make this confusing, towards the end of the round, another player at the table asks her, if she has threes and she flat out says that she does not. So she denies in real time at that table that she did not have threes. Take a look. Okay. You have fucking three? Two pairs that hit. No. You've got a three. No? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just thought he's, I'm, 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 this is a pure bluff catcher. What's even more is earlier in the round, she leans over nervously and says, three's no good. Like trying to figure out, are my threes good enough to win this? I think he might have me though. Three's no good. So she vocalizes having threes. Now, is this a bluff? Is she trying to get a read on him? I don't know, but she does say that. She says she has threes. Then she says flat out that she doesn't have threes to the other player, then gets on social media and says she thought she had threes. So it's very confusing to know what's going on in her head. Let's bring in the body language. So I wanna focus on the moment where both their hands are turned over and everyone realizes what's going on and who won. She had four jack hunts. What? Whoa. Look at you. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, that's, look at Garrett's face. That is. Yeah, that's a poker right there. That was sick. Wow. That's strong. That was sick. Oh, shit. That is super, super strange. You can see his reaction. 128.3. I think it was a First and foremost, the announcer. He loses it. In fact, this isn't the first time during this hand where he's commenting how unorthodox this is. Call. She calls? <laughs> For once, but it's up to you. Yikes. Oh my God. Is it possible that her hand might be misread in the card graphics or something? Again, I don't want to go into the details of how poker is played, but basically, no player who's even close to pro would have played this this way. Because even if she highly thinks he's bluffing, she would have to think that her bad hand is better than his bad hand. Because he could be bluffing, but still have a bad hand that beats hers. Next, let's look at Garrett. The first thing that happens in his face, the moment those cards are turned over, is shock and he actually goes into freeze, fight, or flight response. When we're faced with a threat, when we're faced with something that makes us highly uncomfortable, we go into freeze, fight, or flight. And typically freeze comes first. We freeze as we assess, and that's exactly what's going on here. He freezes, there's very little movement, and he's assessing. He also stays silent for a very long time. For like minutes, he says nothing. But we see a couple of really interesting gestures. One of them is, at some point, we see as he turns away, and we call this exit checking. Usually when we're overwhelmed, stressed, or we feel something's wrong, we look for a way out. We look for that exit. And at the very same time, we see digital flexion. That's when the fingers come in, and he almost makes a fist. It's a very tense 
fingers coming in. And this is very consistent with high stress, or like I said earlier, he's in freeze, fight, or flight. And obviously, when we go to fight mode, when we feel like we're gonna fight something, those fingers can come in because it's representing physically what we're feeling in our head, the altercation that's about to come, the accusation that's about to come. The other thing that's really interesting is while other players, as well as Robbie yourself, are kind of justifying the reasoning, and as a really intelligent player, Garrett knows that it doesn't make sense logically, we see a very pronounced mouth shrug as he turns his head and he does this. But she had the blocker to the straight force draw. That's boom, that's the key. And that's a mouth shrug. It's different from lip compression. Lip compression is simply when the lips thin out like this. Mouth shrugging is usually a little more tense, but more importantly, causes puffing in the cheeks and in the upper lip because it moves upwards a little like this. See, and that's what we saw with him quite clearly as he turned his head away and I blocked with that slow blink. The best research in the world on shrugging, not just mouth shrugs, but all kinds of shrugs, was conducted at Université Paris-Nanterre by Camille Debras and she discovered a bunch of reasons why we shrug and how we shrug. And I could give you a two hour lecture on all the different ways we shrug and what it could mean, but basically it comes down to this. Shrugging, mouth shrugging included, indicates a lack of something. So it could be something like, I don't know. It could be, I don't care. It could be, I have nothing to add to this. So it's basically, I don't something. And in this case, it's out of frustration it's disagreement and it's no, there, I don't believe this. So right there in that moment, his body language suggests that he decided she cheated immediately. He's not buying any of the solutions. He's looking around, he's not finding anything that, that works for him. But look at her, look at her behavior because there's quite a bit going on with her too and it's out of place. Something feels weird. In fact, two things feel weird and I'll tell you what they are. The first is this because we're technically still talking about what she thought her hand was. I've seen that happen a lot in poker. I've seen, I, I used to deal, I've directed tournaments before, not professionally at this level obviously, but for events. And I've seen that happen, where someone thinks they had something else. But let me tell you what happened in 100% of those cases. When they turn over the cards and realize that that's not what they have, we see a very distinct aha moment, where they, and there's a double take often, where they turn over and they go, Oh, I thought I had Jack three. I, or like you see that moment, whether they express it or not, sometimes they don't express it, but you see that moment. Now, maybe she realized it and felt like she would feel stupid if she expressed that on national television. That already she's a new player, she's female in a male dominated sport. She doesn't want people to go, oh come on, how, how stupid are you that you would do something like that, that you would think you had the wrong cards when the stakes are this high. So maybe that happened, that moment happened, but she hit it really well. But even at that, there's never a moment where I see any shock, realization, or, oh my God, that, that's not what I, I thought I had something else. We don't see that moment. Second, and this is also really weird, we don't see a moment of celebration whatsoever. Now, if this was in her baseline to where she stays calm, I would say maybe, maybe, maybe. But she's someone who emotes quite a bit. We see a lot of smiles. In previous games, we've seen in the short clips that I've seen her get quite excited when something goes her way. She ups and downs emotionally. She just won a massive hand, over $100,000, against a very celebrated player. And she did it, according to her, based on her read, her tell. So if she's not celebrating the money, at the very least, shouldn't she be celebrating the fact that she just read a very well-known player? There would be something there. The cards would turn over. There would be a, some exclamation, something. There's nothing. Well, actually, there isn't nothing. There is something, and it's a heck of a lot of face touching. Her hand comes up. She's touching her face a lot in all kinds of ways. In fact, for a very long stretch, she doesn't stop touching her face as she's talking. So what does face touching actually mean? Well, the best research on face touching was conducted at the University of Granada, and they found that when we're under a lot of stress, or being deceptive, the blood flow of our face actually shifts. It goes to different places depending on the kind of stress we're experiencing. Sometimes it goes up to the brain to help us think more. Sometimes it goes down to the nose to help us breathe more in high stress. And often the shift that we could see with thermal scans causes someone to touch their face. 
particularly around the nose. It happens in high stress a lot. And of course, going back to the old thumper ring, which is more advanced than any thumper I've ever seen, uh, she is fidgeting a lot with her ring, which explains to me why at some point it's upside down. We, we could clearly see her fidgeting. So there's fidgeting, there's stress, there isn't that celebration moment. There's quite a bit of defensiveness. There's a bit of offensiveness where she's attacking and saying, you've been letting me do this to you, you've let me do this to you before. You know, I, I can read your tells. Uh, and a lot of face touching. So what does this all mean? Not much. Can it mean that she's being deceptive? Yes, it can. Is it enough to form a cluster to say that this is a lot of deceptive behavior? Yes, but lie detection doesn't work that way. There's not, we don't look at behaviors and go, that person's lying. Indicators of deception are basically indicators of stress. In a normal conversation, when we see them happen, we go, oh, that was weird. And in an interrogation or an interview, it tells us that we need to dig there because deception might be taking place. But you know what else could be taking place? Stress. She's playing a very high stakes game. She's new to the game. She's playing a good player. She doesn't know what's going on, or maybe she does, but we see the stress. So yes, she's stressed. So anyone who says, oh, she's obviously lying because she did this or she did that, we don't know that. It can indicate deception, but not with certainty. So all this to answer the question, do I believe that she thought she had a jack three? Keeping in mind that in her previous hand, she had a jack three. Keeping in mind that she said she did, then she said she didn't, then she said she did again. Uh, keeping in mind the fact that there's no aha moment, there's no surprise moment where she realizes, oh my God, I don't have a jack three. It's so hard to say. I've been going back and forth a lot. And where I landed is this. If she thought that she had a jack three, it wasn't for that entire hand. There may have been bursts where she thought she had jack three. Uh, like when she made that call or something, she slipped for a second and then re-remembered almost instantly or shortly thereafter. But I don't believe that she spent that entire hand thinking she had a jack three. She looks down at her hand numerous times, a lot. She, she asks for more time to think about it, looks at her hand again. Uh, there isn't that surprise moment. She says to the other player she doesn't have a jack three. So to me, it's possible that there were little moments where she thought for a second she did, but I don't believe that for most of that hand or for all of that hand, she thought she had a jack three the whole time. I, I don't believe that. Next up is the theory that she simply read his tells and knew or felt that he didn't have a good hand at all. He was bluffing and that uh, she had the better hand. She even tweeted shortly after saying, Garrett, I've got an idea. After I'm vindicated, let's go heads up. The whole world can watch me read you all day. So notice how her confidence there isn't on her ability to play, but her ability to read. That's where she's confident. There are a few reasons that it's difficult for me to digest that this was simply a good read. And here's what they are. But before I say them, let me say this. It's possible that in the context of a poker game like this, she's better at reading people than I am because she's a professional player. She's at She's played against them before. And let's not forget that the fact that women have better intuition than men isn't just a myth. I'll leave some links in the description. It's researched that women actually have more activity in the parts of the brain that deal with emotional intuition. And the reason for this is probably in the way that we evolved because throughout evolution, women often had to take care of babies and babies don't have the capacity to tell you what they want. So I'm gonna have to get very good at intuitively connecting and understanding certain things without it being said to them. But whatever the case, here's why I'm a little skeptical. First off, even if she thinks he's bluffing, she has a terrible hand. So even if he's bluffing, his bad hand would have to be worse than her bad hand. She has a jack high. It's really not great. So. Even on luck alone, he might have something that's a little better. So even if she's reading him, it's still a bad play with considering what she has. Furthermore, he's not entirely bluffing. He's hopeful. There are certain things that can happen on this table that would really give him a great hand. Those possibilities are open. They're out there. So even if she could read his bluffs, it's a half bluff. It's not a full bluff. So even if she's really good at reading, she would know that, okay, well, I don't know what's going on. I better fold this hand. Finally, if I'm looking at it and I have to tell you what are the moments that would allow me to indicate that he's bluffing, well, look at it yourself. Look at his behavior a little bit. We could see that he's hesitant. We could say he's not sure. He's not very confident in this move. And at some point, we see a very clear lip compression, which happens when we're holding something back. We're not saying something. But here's what's interesting. While he's doing that lip compression, she's looking down. In fact, she's looking down a lot throughout this. 
If she's reading him, wouldn't you expect her to look at him, try to get that read? She is looking down a lot. I really didn't see stretches where she was in any way trying to analyze him. So unless what she means by reading is using her psychic vibes to sense his thoughts, I'm not seeing too much reading at all. I've been reading people my entire life and call me crazy, but one of the essential parts of reading someone is looking at them. But maybe the possibility of what she's saying is that she's reading his habits because she knows the way like when he's bluffing, the way he progresses, what he raises, the way he plays. Maybe that's what she means. Maybe she has great intuition. Maybe she sensed or saw something that I didn't see her see. So maybe, I'll make that a maybe. Maybe she actually read him. Maybe she's really good at that aspect of poker. Now before we conclude, and I tell you what I think happened here, based on the body language, based on cheating technique, what happened, uh, I want to talk about an interview that she actually did after the game on the podcast of a gentleman named Joe Ingram. Now I really enjoyed listening to this podcast. He had a whole bunch of guests that were involved in the situation. He's a great vlogger. He really understands the game of poker and he really seems like a great person. So I very much enjoyed watching that and I'll leave a link in the description. I encourage you to go watch it to get a better understanding of the situation. But during that interview, she called in and he had a chance to ask her some questions. Now, I don't want to go into a detailed analysis of that conversation because I have a feeling more interviews are going to come out where I could see her and that helps me so much more than just one where she called into the show. Uh, but there are a few things I want to talk about from that interview really quick. One of them is at some point he flat out asks her about the cheating accusation. I just want to be sure you're saying there was no device in the water bottle, the Jaka coaching water bottle, not a device in the ring, not a device in the necklace. You didn't have some sort of secret device hidden in your pants. Like that's kind of my understanding of what you're trying to say, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, and I, and I, I wish that I just got naked right then and there and just let them have everything. I really do. So he says, so what you're telling me is there was none of these things, none of these devices. And from her, we get an instant denial. So she goes, yes, that's what I'm saying. She hesitates a little. She stumbles on her words, but then instantly doubles down and says, I wish that I just took off my clothes right there and they just checked everything. It's not the first time she says this in the interview. She says this a lot on numerous occasions. She encourages the investigation. And this is normally a pretty good sign. Yeah, of course, sometimes someone get arrogant about it and be like, they'll never find it. So yeah, check all you want. But normally her bringing up like, I want them to check. I want them to look at all the footage, take my clothes. They should have taken my clothes. Usually is a little bit more of a good sign. But here's the really big caveat on this one. Joe, again, seems like a great guy who knows a lot about poker, but he's not an interrogator and he's not an interviewer. And the way he formulated that question is really not a great way to formulate it. Let me tell you what the best way to formulate that question would have been. It's called a presumptive question. And there's a lot of examples on the channel when I do interrogation analysis of how this is used in interrogation really effectively. And the way it works is this. Instead of saying, so are you, are you telling me this? And her saying yes, which is a really easy way for her to deny it because he's just saying, you didn't do any of this right and all she has to do is say, right. Instead of that, the way it should have been asked ideally would have been for him to look to his phone or look at something and say, and come back and say, Robbie, is there any reason someone who was there would tell me that they know you had some tech on you that day? Because look at what that question does. When he says to her, Am I right in assuming this? He's saying, you're the one who knows. You're in the position of authority. I'm not. But when you say it that way, presumptive question, you don't accuse, you don't say, there's someone who said this. And what you go, is there any reason someone would? Now what happens is, think about it in her head, she has to go, wait, who would he have, who would he have talked to? If she's guilty, she would go, who would he have talked to? Who could know? Did somebody see something? Do I need to cover? Maybe she doesn't want to say something because then somebody's going to say, oh, she had this and she might have to backpedal. So, it plants what's called a mind virus. Now she's thinking about it. Whereas if she's innocent, she would instantly go, no, nobody would tell you that. Instantly with full confidence. And there are examples on the channel of it both working and not working. To where an interrogator said, is there any reason someone would find some of your DNA at the crime scene? And the person instantly goes, no, absolutely not. It would blow me away if that happened. And that typically pushes us towards innocence because they instantly deny it. So yeah, it would have been better if the question was asked in such a way that it gets her to really think about her answer rather than just set up a denial for her 
and all she has to do is hit the yes button. But even despite that, there's something about the way that she's denying this that's really confident, like, I'm totally okay with an investigation. And then the other line is something she says later in the interview where she says, I know what I was thinking and where my headspace was. I, I've seen the footage now. I know what I was thinking and I, and I, and I know it was a stupid call and I, I know where my headspace was. But earlier during the interview, she says she wasn't sure. And when, when, he, when he's talking, when she's talking about what was going on in her head, we never really get a clear answer. There's a bit of stumbling, a bit of confusion. And she made the point that she thought she had a Jack three. So that contradicts, I know what I was thinking and where my headspace was. I don't know. It kind of seems like there's a lot of confusion. She's trying to bring her confidence up, but she herself is not sure. Okay, so here it is, my conclusion. Now, mind you, this might change. If there's some interviews, I could do analysis on her body language. If she's asked about the event, uh, in a calmer situation than a high stakes table, I might see some stuff. But for right now, here's my opinion on this. If she's cheating, and I'm not saying she is yet, I'm telling you if she's cheating, it's most likely in one of two ways. Either she's using a daub system, so she has a product somewhere, whether it's on her ring, whether it's in her jacket, which would you know explain, if you wanna believe that, why she's going down there, why she's fidgeting with her ring, she has a product and she's marking the high cards so that when the cards are out on the table, she has a way of seeing, maybe it's with the glasses, infrared, or maybe it's just a special way that she knows how to look at it that would allow her to know where the high cards are. The reason I think that this is possible is because if she looked at his cards and saw the back and they were not marked, she would know that he's not holding high cards. And if she's marked the tens, she would know he doesn't have a 10, which in that case is one of the possibilities that he was representing with the way that he was betting. So if she's cheating, that would be a believable way. The second believable way would be that she has someone, whether they work with the organization or not, doesn't matter, who has a device that intercepts the RFID signals of the cards because when we're watching it on a screen that's how we know that's how we know what cards everyone has instantly because the cards have chips in them and when they go down on the table in designated spots there's readers and they display what everyone has so it's possible that someone is interfering with that signal intercepting that signal and using a thumper to signal her now it would be very difficult to signal specific cards like he has a seven of clubs and an eight of clubs she would have to sit there for 45 minutes which goes <laughs> it would take a long time. So it wouldn't look that way. If the person's signaling her, it's simply to say either yes, you should bet or no, you shouldn't. So that might explain why she would go in on this because she's being signaled through a thumper, not on her ring, not in her jacket, but in her pocket that it's the right thing to do to bet here. And statistically, if you know his hand and her hand, it is the right thing to do here. But if you don't know his hand, almost nobody would make this play, which is the reason she's being accused of cheating. So it's possible that that's what's happening. But here it is, big moment. Do I believe that that's what's happening? Do I believe that a daub or a thumper with a, a interception is happening? And the answer is, I do not. I do not think that she was cheating here. And let me explain why I think that. To say she was cheating would mean that she got the signal somehow or saw the cards and knew that she should be betting, but that's only part of the equation if someone is cheating. The other part is the perception. What you're projecting and how easy it is to get caught. This is not the moment to cheat. If you have this really brilliant system, whether it's a daub or a thumper, you would wait for a much better occasion. Again, remember what I said earlier, Cheaters don't always cheat. They wait for the opportune moment. This is absolutely not the opportune moment. Now you might counter that and say, well, she didn't know what he had. All she knew was she has him beat because maybe she was thumped that you're good. But looking at her hand, jack four, looking at the table and calling an all in is nonsense. And any poker player would know that. So if she's cheating, it's highly unlikely that she would do it at this moment it's way too suspicious. Then we have to consider the fact that again, she didn't react when those cards flipped and that's bugging me. But here's the thing, sometimes with body language, as crazy as it sounds, something means the opposite thing as well. 
Like sometimes we see signs of confidence, but it doesn't mean the person is confident. It means they're unconfident and they're overcompensating. So think about it this way. If you were cheating and you just won a pot that was a little bit under $300,000, you just made a ton of money, wouldn't you make a point to really react and make sure, oh my God, I won, no matter how bad it's overacted, wouldn't you say, okay, if I don't react here, they're gonna know I'm cheating? So the absence of a reaction to me, as much as it's suspicious, it makes me go, why didn't she react happily? It's also suspicious in the other direction. If she's cheating, why didn't she at least fake a reaction? And my main reason, my final reason that I think she did not cheat, and by the way, I'm not 98% sure she didn't cheat. I'm 63.2% sure she didn't cheat, is this. She played really poorly. That's a fact. Whether she cheated or she didn't cheat, she played really poorly. So, why assume she cheated? Because either she cheated and played really poorly, or she just played really poorly, and that would explain it. So why do we have to reach for more when the less explains the entire thing? I think she got overconfident. I don't know if she read something, saw a quick thing, saw the way he was playing, recognized the pattern in the way that he's playing. She just got overconfident. She's also someone who's very antsy. She doesn't like to sit games out. And she even said in her interview with uh, Joe Ingram that she gets bored very easily. I think she just got arrogant and wanted to see what would happen. And I think she had a moment where she gambled instead of played poker. And this is ultimately why so many pro poker players are bothered by this. Because poker players, professional ones, very long ago stopped thinking of poker as gambling and saw it as a strategic game. They think of everything as strategy and they don't give any weight to intuition or very little weight to intuition. She's a new player, she's different. We can obviously see her style is different, her vibe is different. I think she's not at a point yet where she plays only based on logic and intuition is still a part of it. So I think not understanding the logic the way Garrett does, she just made a really stupid call that ended up working out in her favor. Uh, I'm not saying she's a stupid person. I'm just saying she played really stupidly in that moment. And again, please remember, I'm not 100% confident on this. That's just where I'm leaning. I think the internet is a very polarized place where everyone has to have an opinion and it's almost shameful to admit that I'm not sure, I don't know. I'll be the first to say that in this case, I'm not sure and I don't know. And if you're watching this video and you disagree with my conclusion, but you learned a couple of things along the way, then that's perfectly fine too. You could take the thing we learned about Dobbs and go, oh yeah, maybe she was doing something like that and further elaborate your opinion that she was cheating. To me, it doesn't make a difference. I'm analyzing and my conclusion is the least important part of it. Whew, well, that was a wild roller coaster. We saw some cheating demonstrations. We learned how to avoid being cheated. We looked at some body language. I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments what you think about all this. Which way are you leaning? Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments and I will see you on the next one.